Thanks everyone. So good evening. Welcome to Managing Holiday St Stress with Dr. David German, a board certified psychiatrist, and Dr. Stacy Pearson Wharton, Dean of Health and Wellness and Director of Susquehanna University's Counseling Center. I'm Susan Kreischer, Associate Director of Alumni Relations. Before I turn things over to the doctors, I want to welcome several Susquehanna staff who are joining us tonight, including President Jonathan Green and First Lady Lynn Buck, Melissa Kumora, Vice President for Advancement, Becky Bramer Toth, Associate Vice President for Advancement, Leslie Imhoof, Associate Director of the Annual Fund, Chris Markle, Senior Advancement Officer, Tess Marsh, Employer Relations Coordinator, Jody Swartz, Administrative Assistant, Logan Sweet, Associate Director of Advancement Communication, and Stephanie Veit, the new Director of Alumni Relations. If you have questions for David and Dr. Stacy, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. We will do our best to answer all of the questions at the end. Tonight's conversation between David and Dr. Stacy will provide you with practical tips to help prevent holiday-related stress and anxiety, including setting realistic expectations, planning ahead, and asking for support when you need it. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stacy Pearson Wharton. Dr. Stacy earned a PhD in counseling psychology from Penn State University and served as the Assistant Vice President of Health and Wellness at, Wellness at the University of South Florida before joining Susquehanna University in 2015. She wears many hats, including Dean of Health and Wellness at Susquehanna University, licensed psychologist, keynote speaker with Campus Speak, host of Being the Dot podcast, executive coach, and organizational consultant. Dr. Stacy. Well, hello. Good evening, everybody. It's so great to be with you tonight to have the opportunity to moderate this uh, panel of one of our wonderful alumni. Susan, thanks so much. David German graduated from Susquehanna University in 1984 with a degree in chemistry and was a member of the cross country and track teams. He earned his doctorate of osteopathic medicine from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. He then moved to Washington, D.C. to complete residencies in family medicine, emergency medicine, and psychiatry at the George Washington University. Over the course of 28 years, his career in psychiatry has included emergency rooms, the homeless, teaching, and private practice. Currently, David is in private practice in Washington, D.C. and is a clinical assistant, clinical assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the George Washington University Medical Center. Everybody, please welcome Dr. J David German tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Stacy, and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome. You President. want me to go with the first question? Not yet. I'm not ready. I have a few things I want to say. I have a few things I want to say, I think, on my mind to get things started. Uh, I just want to Welcome everyone, President Green, First Lady Lynn Buck, and Board of Trustees, uh, colleagues and friends in advancement, and uh, the alumni board, and the alumni who are joining us tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this uh, topic for a long time, and it's actually a topic that comes up all the time uh, around the holidays. And it's actually not just the holidays. And I think one way that I think about when we're talking about stress, often it, it, it means that we're not experiencing the intimacy uh, or the closeness with the people around us. And that's, it's, it's very sad, it's very demoralizing. It's, it, you know, we, we're missing out. And uh, one of the things that comes up around the holidays often is, you know, this feeling that uh, that's what the stress is, you know, how come we don't feel connected? Um, I think these webinars are a wonderful example of um, when there's forces beyond us that separate us. Uh, we as human beings and people wanna really find any way we can to get together. And I give the SU community 
you know, great credit for thinking and being creative and figuring out what are the things that we can do to bring students and faculty and administrators and alumni together. And I think these one webinars are doing just that. So thank you for all that have been, you know, the creative process, you know, putting this uh, webinar series together. I think it's a wonderful way of uh, maintaining contact. Um, you know, the holidays, I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So all I knew was Christmas. And when I moved to Washington to do my training, uh, there were a lot of different people there that I didn't really know uh, from being in Williamsport. People from different countries, cultures, traditions, religious uh, affiliations, um, races. And it, the, the diversities uh, were fascinating and interesting and a lot of fun for me. And around the holidays, especially what I would call Christmas, other holidays that were celebrated were Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and winter solstice and the Vietnamese New Year. And many of them uh, focused around light. And I began thinking about this as the season of light. And what does that mean? Because I felt that was something that we all could relate to. And uh, in, in uh, thinking about what to discuss, in addition to giving you some tips, uh, I didn't really want to just give you a list. I wanted to give you some things to think about. And in the, I think we're all aware of you know, what's happened in Kentucky. Uh, and I couldn't help but think a lot about uh, the tornadoes and how they ripped apart families and communities and uh, there was, you know, death and destruction. And, you know, how do we, you know, celebrate holidays, you know, among tragedy and loss? And, you know, one of the things, what came, what came to my mind uh, was a personal experience I had 30 years ago when, you know, I had some personal struggles with my own sexuality and I landed myself in a hospital and after discharge, I was in a group. And uh, it was very hard being in a group, but I found the group very supportive. Uh, eventually, a place where people could know, you could let yourself be known, and it was, felt really good to be known. And Christmas, the first Christmas was really difficult uh, because family members and friends really had no idea what I was struggling with. However, the therapist did. And there were two of us and we really wanted to meet in the week leading up to Christmas. And it may have even been Christmas Eve. And Beverly Lynn uh, was the leader and uh, she brought cookies and we were thrilled to be there. And she brought a shoebox. And uh, the, my friend, I will call him my friend and he was my friend. Uh, we were like, what is in the shoebox? And we were talking and eating some cookies and it was good, it was a safe place to be. And toward the end, she took the lid off the shoebox and she had made Christmas ornaments. And she had made Christmas ornaments out of ribbons and they were angels. And uh, she said, you know, that there was something very special about angels and our being able to be known to each other and to have this kind of intimacy or this kind of closeness and openness and honesty. And we picked you know, an angel out of the box and, you know, took it home. And I had been in a place where I wasn't working and I didn't have much money. And it gave me the idea of making Christmas ornaments as gifts. So I went home and I had a bunch of hymnals from church and I don't know where I had seen this idea. And I uh, cut out some pages and I rolled them up in pencils and I had these little rolls of hymnals, uh, hymnal pages. And I glued them together and I put a little sprig of pine cone and, and tied a ribbon. And then on the bottom, uh, what I felt in that group was uh, peace, love, and joy. And I said, just wishing everyone peace, love, and joy. And I think that's the light that we're trying to hold on to during the holidays. And the stress is when we start losing touch with that light. And um, I might add hope also these days that the light also provides hope. And, uh, and, and, and we really need 
a lot of hope these days. Um, and part of that comes with the intimacy and closeness that we have with the people around us. So, you know, having uh, said that, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Stacy, and uh, we're gonna have a conversation here about different topics that I hope, uh, you know, make you think, not just a checklist that you can go down and say, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, but to really think about how these things are affecting you and be more aware of, you know, what may be missing or what you might want to have around holidays. So Dr. Stacy, thrilled to be here with you. I'm glad to be here as well. And that was inspirational. I feel good. Just that's a tip in and of itself, whether you realize it or not, of holding on to peace and joy and hope and love. And, and so thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. So Dr. German, there's been a lot of talk in the news about ho the holiday blues or holiday stress or maybe even seasonal affective disorder. And I'm wondering if you could tell our guests tonight a little bit about what does the holiday blues or holiday stress look like? Um, and how do you know if you have it? So I would characterize the holiday blues, uh, you know, it may be because I've been doing this kind of work uh, for a long time, but I also think we all experience blues at some time in our lives. Uh, there's blues for all kinds of things. And the blues may be a feeling that things are depressing. It may be related to grieving. It may you may feel demoralized as though you're not good enough. There could be some shame associated with it uh, or guilt, uh, you know, not meeting expectations. There are a lot of expectations around the holidays um, and the de desire to meet all those expectations to have, you know, the best holiday, you know, there can be. And it can be very overwhelming uh, in a way you can lose track of yourself. Um, you know, who am I, what am I doing? Who am I doing this for? And here's what I really wanna do, but I'm not doing those things. I wanna spend some quality time with my kids or I wanna spend some quality time with, you know, my best friend or my, my spouse or, you know, attend church. I wanna do some things that are meaningful uh, for me uh, while participating in, you know, some of the other activities. And I think we can get so caught up in feeling that we have to be uh, participate in uh, everything, be somebody who can do it all. And in the process of doing it all, we lose the spirit of Christmas and, and, and the light gets pretty dim. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what differentiates holiday blues from depression, because a lot of people feel they're depressed, is that holiday blues, people feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And they may say to themselves, you know, oh my God, I can't wait till the holidays are over so I can get back to my life. And I think that's indicative of what holiday blues are. The question is, what can change? What needs to change? So that, yeah, you can look at the light at the end of the tunnel, but you can appreciate, you know, the spirit of the holidays rather than, you know, dreading and feeling as though you're drudging through this period of time. Uh, with social media, you may have all heard of FOMO, fear of missing out. People tend to post the best of themselves and the best of experiences and everything they're doing. And it's very idealized. And I don't know anyone, including my own life, where everything is perfect and everything is idealized. There's always bumps in the road and there's always disappointments, but you can experience the, the, the sadness or the tragicness of disappointments while at the same time, you know, enjoying the spirit of, you know, the Christmas or the joy of getting together or the excitement of watching your kids or grandchildren open gifts uh, or getting together with your coworkers or your neighbors. Um, so, you know, I think if you start feeling like that you're getting dragged down, take a time out, you know, go for a walk, you know, take, you know, take some time and listen to some music, do something for yourself and just try and slow down and say, okay, where are my priorities? And, and how can I shift this feeling of, you know, whether it's dread or just feeling overwhelmed to something that has 
you know, a bit more spark in it that can get you going. Um, seasonal affective disorder is, is fascinating. And, and I'm, you know, I, I actually, I have a full spectrum light box right here and I've had one for 30 years, I swear by it. Norman Rosenthal, who's a colleague of mine up in Rockville, I've been talking with him for 30 years. He, he's from South Africa. He, did the, he was the primary investigator for seasonal affective disorder at NIH. And uh, you know, we all have circadian rhythms and we're all on a spectrum. Some, some of us can't tolerate the dark at all and have to live close to the equator. Some of us, the darkness in the midwinter doesn't seem to affect us much, but most of us are somewhere in the middle. And if we're in the middle, we, we lack energy, you know, we can't focus, we just want to eat high carbohydrate food, you know, we eat and eat. Like if you think about what you eat at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, there's all the cookies and, you know, alcohol and all of these high carbohydrate foods that just make you feel really heavy and feel like you want to take a nap rather than go out and go for a walk. So if you feel like it's affecting your, the season is affecting your mood or the darkness or the short days, you can get a full spectrum light and the recommendation is 30 minutes a day. I generally recommend that people use it as their desk lamp and they, you can use it all day. There may be circumstances where it may not be wise, but I use this lamp all day. It's wonderful in the morning and it's, it's great into the evening. It shouldn't affect your sleep. And uh, some people get dawn simulators where they begin to, the light comes on early in the morning. Um, and you're, and the other? So I, I'm not sure. I think it was um, the holiday holiday stress. Oh, holiday and, stress. Okay. You know, I think what would be interesting to even to talk about that a little bit from the lens of perfectionism and how that can play a role in upping um, one's holiday stress. Right. And I think with COVID and the sparsity that we, or the lack or the void that we had last year, of being so isolated and scared, you know, being in our homes, doing FaceTime, you know, afraid to go to the supermarket, you know, I mean, it, 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 it was frightening. And I think it was traumatic for many of us, if not all of us. And it was, it was not, as I say, it was in all our backyards. A lot of times people can say, oh, that's not a big deal. It's not in my backyard. COVID was in our backyard. It was in our houses. It was in our families and it was scary. And there's a lot of excitement this year, even though there's concerns about, you know, upticks in, in infections. And certainly there are ways, you know, with vaccinations to be safe. Uh, but I think people are excited. They want to go out. They want to see their their families, they want to see their grandchildren, their kids, they want to get together with friends and neighbors, they want to have parties, uh, they want to decorate more, uh, they want the intimacy, and I've talked about this, we want to get together, it feels good to get together, and it's like getting together on SU's campus at homecoming, what a great feeling, there are lots of people, we've been, we were waiting for it, and we, we converged, and it was wonderful, and I think everyone has the same expectation uh for the holidays however it creates a lot of stress it means shopping and the expectations of gifts and food and meals and you know all the different kinds of things that go into a family gathering so mm -hmm. and it also means maybe depriving ourselves of the time that we would normally have for ourselves in terms of a schedule or you know working out or meditation or having quiet time to read uh, or just spending time with our spouse or, you know, uh, it, it makes balancing our lives uh, more difficult because we have so much more that we want to add to an already tightly scheduled life. That's right. Well, and I, I think too, I, I love what you said there, that um, it, it, it's, it's to the, the, you know, matching family pajamas and the perfect picture on Facebook and the, the, right. the, the decorations just nicely so and um, gifts and shopping and money and um, writing Christmas cards. And um, th there are just so many things that we can get caught up in that can feel oftentimes overwhelming and right. stressful. And I would even encourage people to think about lowering your expectations. Mm -hmm. and, and and balancing that out to a more kind of healthy, boundaried 
realistic place. And if people, I've stopped sending Christmas cards myself and I actually send New Year's cards just to give myself a little bit more of a window um, so that I'm not trying to deal with Christmas cards during the time that it's so intense. Um, right. or, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's a great idea. And, mm -hmm. and, and as you were saying, um, and I've come to learn, you know, what's, what's good enough? Mm. Oh, okay. really? Do people really appreciate all the perfectionism? We might see it mm -hmm. on a tree or in our decorations uh, because we're more attuned to the imperfections. But if right, our right. guests and our family come in and they step back and they say, oh, you know, this is wonderful. And I don't know many people in families who haven't appreciated a good home cooked meal, even if it doesn't look perfect. It often mm -hmm. tastes good. And it's really yes. getting around the table and having yep. time to visit. And, and a candid one isn't so bad either. That's true. That's <laughs> true. And delegating is another way to stress, you know, help with stress. Have courses yes, and the college, your college kids or your high school kids, they can serve different courses or clean up. Or a wonderful time to spend with your teenagers is working with them doing dishes because it's so hard to spend time with teenagers because they're drawn to their friends and you wanna spend time with them. There are small things that you can do together that they can participate and you have time to visit with them. That's great. So one of the things that uh, we talked about some David during the, our time of prep was how medical concerns can contribute to holiday stress. Um, in particular, just really trying to manage uh, that during the holidays. I wonder if you could talk some about that and just be sure to include uh, managing even a medical provider or a vendor who might not be available during the holidays. Sure, sure. So as, as Dr. Stacy had said, I, uh, I've had many wonderful experience and settings to practice medicine in as a family doc in the emergency room, as an ER doc and as a psychiatrist. And they're all, you know, invaluable and in contributing to uh, my understanding not only of myself, but also of patients, uh, you know. So my number one phone call on Christmas Eve at 10 or 11 o'clock, or for that matter, it could be any night, but often on Christmas Eve is a panic call. I don't have my medicine. I don't have my antidepressant. I ran out last night and I forgot. And Usually the patients are horrified uh, and they're full of shame. They feel terrible that they let it go to the last minute. So what I, what I try to do in working, you know, in, in sort of preparing, you know, patients to think about, take a half hour. A lot of times we feel like we don't have the time, but if we don't take the half hour, then we end up spending an hour later that's really stressful. Take a half hour. And if you have acute medical situations, you know, whether it's physical or mental health, you know, have a list of your doctors in your phone or in your wallet. I mean, if, there, if there's acute, you know, situations related to your heart or your depression or your, your psychosis, you know, have someone who knows, uh, you know, what's going on, a point person who also has a list of your doctors. In your contact with doctors, be aware of, uh, are they going to be in the office? Who's available? Who's covering? If they're not covering, for instance, my patients, if I'm out of the office for an extended period of time, and these are patients that need to be seen regularly, I introduce them to another psychiatrist and have them visit, have a visit with them before I leave. Um, you know, most people don't need that, but for some patients who are acutely ill, that's very helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Pill boxes. I am a huge advocate, and I don't know a doctor that isn't, whether it's for your, your little baby or your teenager or my age or elderly. Um, I'm getting into the elderly age group, but, but actually pill boxes are great because what it does is it helps you organize your medicine and it makes you think about, okay, do I have a week's worth of medicine in here to fill for next week? And if I don't, I need to call the pharmacy for a refill or call my doctor to get an appointment for a refill. Ideally, we recommend you know, two weeks at least. Um, don't, don't hold things. Uh, if there are acute things going on and you wonder 
if it's a, going to be a problem, assume it is and take care of it. Because the closer you get to a holiday and the idea that your doctor may not be as available or you might not be able to get into the office, the more anxious you're gonna get. And with anxiety comes you know, panic. And then all of a sudden you're making a call at the last minute yeah, okay. when you, know, you could have taken care of it a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it would have eased your anxiety and you, know, you could be able to focus on other things. Um, okay. One thing is to really be mindful of alcohol use. Alcohol, it's part of the social fabric. Everybody, nearly everybody, uh, you know, consumes alcoholic beverages. Um, alcohol is one of the most potent depressants there is. That's, that's how people get intoxicated. It depresses our central nervous system. We don't think as clearly. It impairs our insight and judgment. Our physical, you know, our reflexes don't work. That's why, you know, drunk driving is, you know, such a hazard. Um, People fall down steps, people get hurt. So, you know, if you're out at a party, ensure that you're drinking, watch how much you make, and ensure that you're eating, you know, while you're drinking, watch how much you drink. And maybe before you go out, it would be a good idea to have a designated driver or a way of getting home. If you're going by yourself, maybe it's better to get there by some other means than driving. And with your kids, middle schoolers, starting with middle schoolers, high schoolers and college kids. The right time is now to say, hey, I know you're going out with your friends. You know, if you find yourself in trouble, uh, if you're drinking or using drugs and you're afraid to come home, call us. We mm -hmm. will come and pick you up and we want you to be safe. And uh, those are important discussions and the right time is always now if you're thinking about it. You don't have to remind them every time, but you know, when they're coming home, beginning of break or the, you know, or break starts for high school or they're coming home from college, never hurts to, you know, just comment on that. They know you care. They may not want anything to do with you, or it may seem that way, but they they want to know that you care, and that's one way of showing that you care. That's that's awesome. And so plan ahead as it relates to your medications and such, but also. Um, remember that alcohol is a depressant. And particularly if you know that that sometimes you struggle with the holiday blues and and particularly that that social gatherings, the increase in social gatherings oftentimes will include alcoholic beverages. So be right. uh, what you're saying is be do your due diligence around that to watch how much your intake is yep. uh, as far as alcohol is concerned. And I want to add one thing. Uh, patients who have depression, manic depression, psychosis, uh, dementia. Um, one of the things that helps most uh, for these patients is not just taking their medications and the support they have through psychotherapy or support groups, but also having structure, which means going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time, eating meals. Uh, so the holidays can make it feel like there is an increase of energy moving forward that the pace increases and that can be draining for patients who are depressed and it can be activating for patients who have mania and it can cr uh, create more disorganization for patients who have psychos psychosis or a demented uh, dementia and you can also have and many do have holiday blues on top of their mental illness mm -hmm. That's good. they struggle so with that Go ahead. So I have, so folks, if you're thinking about questions that you want to ask, you can go ahead and start to think about those and throw those into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to. David, I have two more questions. One, yes. maybe a brief answer to, and then maybe um, one last one before we take questions from the audience. Okay. So one of the things that I was aware of here, working here at the university was that there were a lot of losses around COVID, especially for like high school students didn't get their first, didn't get their prom or maybe their graduation. And so as a result of that, when they arrived here on the, our campus, their expectations that everything would be completely amazing was even more heightened than what it typically would be. And I think that that is parallel to our experience of the holidays this year, that because we didn't get to do it last year that the expectation is is that it would be amazing but the complexity is this 
that we're post pandemic and pandemic all at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's some stress in dealing with COVID um, during this time that we're trying to re, um, reconvene and reconnect and have the intimacy and move towards the light and all the things that you said. So I'm wondering what your advice is on dealing with the stress of COVID um, that it will bring to your holiday gather to holiday gatherings. You know, I think uh, first it's important to recognize that if you're a teenager or a college adult or young adult or you're middle-aged or older, your risk assessment is going to be very different. So your risk averse is going to be probably a lot greater if you're older and if you have other medical issues uh, than you are if you're a teenager where you think, you know, you're invincible. Uh, you know, the, the most important thing in terms of people feeling safe uh, is vaccinations. Um, people being vaccinated and uh, having that comfort of knowing that um, there's a sense of safety in that. However, not everyone believes in that. So one of the, one of the things that I suggest is that if, you're, if you have a group getting together, some vaccinated and some not, I think it's important if you're hosting as a family, you know, having a conversation about how, how are we gonna have, you know, we don't have to throw everything away, but we may not be able to have everything we want. So how can we negotiate middle ground? How can we all enjoy the gathering, recognizing that it's important to do it safely and that we all have to feel safe doing it? which means there may not be a lot of hugs and kisses among some people, but that's all right. At least you can maybe sit around the fire pit and chat or you know, be together uh, if, if you've negotiated, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take these safety uh, precautions here, or you develop new traditions. Maybe you visit with family over FaceTime. And you know, one example was you know, a couple saying, hey, we're worried about the relatives of, you know, our extended family who are elderly and we would love to see them and we're gonna miss seeing them. But, you know, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna do something, we're gonna go out, maybe go to the movies, uh, maybe have Chinese food, you know, do something different that may be a new tradition. Um, so be creative. I know we tend to really hold on to what is familiar mm -hmm. and it's, we, we, one of the things I teach, and I think it's so important, is it's really important to be able to step back and allow yourself to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Mm. It's not gonna kill you. It may be really uncomfortable, but think about it and see where there's some give and take. And uh, you know, let's see if we can be creative so that we can have a sense of closeness rather than being you know, very strict yay or nay, yes or no, we're getting together or not getting together, but we have something that we can all share, you know, the closeness. Uh, so I... That's perfect, thank you. Thank you for that. So you've really given us some great advice tonight. Um, as we look to close and take questions from the audience, I'm wondering what are the top two or maybe three to four things that you think are most important for managing holiday stress? I would say number one being self-aware, which means you want to have fun. You want to you want to be close. Uh, you want to see people. So you may have to prioritize. You may not be able to go to all the parties, but how do you have meaningful uh, gatherings? How do you see the people who you really want to see? You don't have to fit all the people you haven't seen all year into, Christmas, into the Christmas weeks you have all year. Uh, how do you take care of yourself? If you feel like you're getting stressed, uh, what we haven't talked about is mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is being able to step back, excuse me, give yourself a break. Maybe stepping out of a particular situation and just taking some slow, relaxed breaths and just letting uh, you know, the energy, just imagine it flowing out um, and closing your eyes or you know, 
uh, imagery, thinking about something pleasant. And two, two apps that I strongly encourage and Sus Susquehanna uh, embraces is Headspace, which are little seven minute meditations. And the gentleman has this South African, maybe Australian uh, accent, and it's very soothing. It takes seven minutes. You get 10 free sessions. Just give it a try, try something different. And then what it does is it takes your mind off all the exterior things for a moment and helps you to, to refocus or regroup. Um, you know, try to keep some of your schedule you know, make certain that you get your sleep, uh, make certain you get outside. Being outside during the winter seasons, even if it's cold, is invigorating. You may find it cold, but it's invigorating and it's important and it's important to get the light. And also it's, it's a time to reflect and maybe a time to, you know, spend some personal time with one person uh, that, you know, it's harder to visit with when you're, when you're in a group. Um, you know, don't be afraid to delegate, you know, share, be open, uh, make it about being together, not so much about, you know, what you give uh, yeah. or, or, you know, expect, you know, um, you know, the traditions, going to church or Christmas Eve service. I mean, if your faith is very important for you and, and really meaningful, and that's where you want to spend time, spend time there. You, you may miss some other things, but continue to do the things that are really important to you. Great. That's perfect. So just uh, for our, our alum that are on the call, uh, Dr. German mentioned um, how great Headspace is. And one of the things that we've been able to offer our student body is a Headspace subscription for free. So we're pretty excited about, uh, about being able to do that. So now we're going to open the floor for questions. You can put your questions in the um, Q&A box and I will read those. And I believe that people might be able to raise their hands and ask questions as well. Is that true, Susan? Yes, it looks like they should be able to do that as well. Okay, and so I'll be moderating both of those. So feel free to put your questions out there and we can uh, take it from there. I know we have one already, which I'll start with, but others can go ahead and uh, put their questions in the Q&A and or raised her hand. So this first question um, is from Seller, Scheller. Uh, and it says, uh, when you were a student at Susquehanna, did you ever imagine the way in which you would impact people's lives for the better? Great question. Uh, I think I had the wish and a desire to impact, you know, people in a positive way. Uh, and I think I was also at, while I was at Susquehanna, I was looking for, you know, professors and staff who would be excellent mentors because I also was aware that I had my own needs. And I think I gravitated toward some very special people in my life who classmates, uh, coaches, who, who made a difference for me. And I have to say that, you know, my own personal struggles also influenced my interest in, in getting into family medicine, but also into psychiatry, because in the field of mental health, there's, there are not nearly enough mental health professionals uh, like Dr. Stacy and myself. Uh, you know, we like to collaborate together, uh, but, you know, we're, we're extremely busy and there's a great need. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy seeing patients and uh, I think uh, I do my best to help. And if I can't, then I uh, look for help above. There's always someone that you can turn to that there should be always someone you can turn to that can help you, you know, become better at what you do. And if I consult with another psychiatrist, they, patients learn something and I learn something, so. Mm -hmm. That's great. So while we wait for um, another question, I have a question for you as well, um, David. So I know one of the things for me that I enjoy about the Christmas season is the little things that spark joy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I love my the Christmas trees in my house or decorating my porch or um, those kinds of things. 
And I'm wondering what kinds of things for you uh, spark joy during this season, um, this holiday season? Uh, being with my kids, going and getting a Christmas tree. Uh, this year- do you, do you chop it? Do you chop it down? Do not chop it down. Uh, <laughs> we do not. Uh, so my husband, Andrew and I, it was Andrew's idea because of COVID and our, we live on a street with 41 houses. They're all row houses, small historic houses. So we, we made, a ginger, made our house a gingerbread house and we have a little park next to us. And uh, I'm the gardener and I try to keep it four seasons. But what we decided to do was to make an abominable snowman and a Rudolph and, and a Grinch and Santa and Frosty. And a lot of little kids come there during the day. And, you know, it, and, and we've had a holiday party in the park on a regular basis. And, and uh, you know, this year's was wonderful because we could all get together. And I think one of the most, uh, one of the things personally for me, I love Christmas Eve services. Mm. I, I love the music. Um, I love the story. Um, I love the singing. I love, you know, the way the stained glass windows look at night. Uh, I mean, that's very meaningful for me. That's, you know, for me personally, I really enjoy that. Uh, and I enjoy seeing my family. Uh, I love Christmas cookies, you know. Um, but, you know, there's, there's sadness also. I mean, we, we think about my father-in-law passed uh, in February and, you know, we miss him and, you know, we end up doing some things that he enjoyed and uh, we wish that he was with us. Uh, so I think one point that is important is that your feelings don't have to be either or. You can have a lot of different feelings at the same time. And if, if, if you have them, you have them. Don't feel like you have to be, hold them inside. I mean, it, it, there again, it, people, people want to, I would hope most people want to know you. And if you happen to be sad or happy, they want to know that. That's great. So we got a couple questions here. One from Jamie Hyde, Hydeman, um, who we'll talk a little bit about that person a little bit later, but she thanks us for an awesome um, webinar and the knowledge. She says, do you have any advice for how to say no to family or other uh, invites if you find yourself overextended? I think that's one we all struggle with. Um, I mean, I would suggest that uh, as we were talking earlier, we really have to prioritize. And I think it's much more fun, at least for us, uh, to go to one or two parties instead of trying just to show up and be present physically for five parties. You really want to be present there so that you can enjoy the time and your and and the host and the friends who are there can enjoy you. So I, I think it's important to be honest and say, hey, I, you know, I really, really appreciate you know, the invitation. We would love to get together. It's not a good time now. Can we plan something for the, after the holidays? Um, you know, I think as I've gotten older, most parties I go to, there are a lot of people at those parties. And you know, are they really gonna miss you? or maybe not going gives them a chance to enjoy their other guests. And maybe having coffee with them might be not, you know, who knows, who knows, there's, there's a range of possibilities. But I, I think it's important to say no, be able to say no, you know, with an explanation and with some honesty, okay. uh, you know, associated with it. And I think people understand. You hope people understand. I think I you think hope. you're absolutely right. And I think too, it goes back to what we were saying about setting realistic expectations for yourself about how much you can do. And sometimes that is connected to your social social life. Yeah. The next question is, do you have any recommendations on dealing with personality conflicts during the holidays? You know, that that is a that's that is tough. You know. Uh, when it comes to personality conflicts, I think we're all aware of what we don't like. Mm. And we tend to focus on what we don't like about that person and want to avoid them. Sure. Uh, and if we need or there's the expectation that 
you know, we are going to be there. Uh, it's sort of, we can feel very defensive. And, you know, the other person may not feel the same way that I'm going to suggest you try, but can you think about, are there some commonalities um, that you share? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about families that are divorced and have children and their traditions are new. And, you know, can those, can those couples step back and look at what brought them together and what, what they shared and be able to interact in that kind of way with their families rather than focusing on the negative? There's always gonna be circumstances where the response from the other person is, is, is not gonna be to your satisfaction. And, you know, you can always just step away and uh, not get involved in a, you know, intense conversation. You can always excuse yeah. yourself and say, you know, I need some space. And uh, I think it's important that you feel comfortable to say, you know, I need some space or I need some time or I want to step outside and get some air and, and uh, you know, not engage. Uh, ideally, you hope that they will and maybe there'd be some progress, but, you know, conflicts and personalities, you know, they're usually longstanding and, and it takes time to work through things. If you both have the time and the interest. Well, and 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 the holiday is not the time to try to work it through. No, no. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then the expectation is everything will come out fine and dandy. And that puts a lot of yeah. pressure on both of you, which often makes things worse. Sure. <clears throat> Great. So the next question is, what advice do you have for someone who is navigating their first Christmas since the loss of a loved one like yourself? Hmm. Your feelings are your feelings. And, you know, I, I reflect on this a lot. Um, my husband doesn't get it. He grew up in a family where everyone expressed exactly what they thought and felt all the time. And mm -hmm. my family was not that way. You kept a lot to yourself. And I admire, you know, Andrew's uh, style. Doesn't always work well, but I, I like the openness. And, uh, you know, there's going to be sorrow and there's going to be loss and you're going to be sad. And, you know, if you can identify someone that, you know, is willing to listen or shares your feelings and spend time with them, uh, photo albums, you know, doing something. Sometimes it's very hard to, to go to synagogue or church you know, alone, but often there are people there who are going to be very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, if you really have a hard time finding uh, anyone for support, there are support groups. If you go Google, you know, uh, spouses um, of, you know, who have a deceased spouse, or there, there are many things that you can try and do, but I think it's really important to you know, think about what's important to you. What are the traditions that may be changing? What are some of the traditions that you might be able to, you know, uh, you know, continue with them in memory? Um, you know, it's, it's hard. And uh, everyone may be joyful uh, around some things, but you don't, don't feel the need. You may be, you know, I, I, I think it's fine to step back or sit back or go to another room or go for, an, for a walk if you need some space. Uh, to breathe and to think and to mourn. Um, I, I think there's value as well in structuring the day. And so not leaving it to chance, but really figuring out who you're going to spend time with, uh, what are new traditions that you can enact among your family, um, who's going to be your support person when you need a minute, when in the day are you going to be thinking about sitting and thinking about that person and maybe giving yourself the space to cry, but I, I or, or, or whatever it is that you need for that day. But I do think, and, and that includes some time that's downtime that you're not mm -hmm. necessarily doing anything. But I do think that there's value in um, taking away some of the um, lack of predictability or ambiguity yes, by, structuring, um, by structuring the day. And I might add, uh, I didn't say this, but it's very important. Uh, you know, what do individuals who have alcohol dependency issues and can't drink? And yeah. to Dr. Stacy's point, AA meetings, 
are really essential during this time of year because the you know you're surrounded by individuals who are drinking a lot more can trigger trigger you know loss because these individuals often you know uh, drank to numb things out drank excessively uh, it's important to have a sponsor and you know if your sponsor is going to be away have a backup sponsor and if you're traveling you know these days with uh, it's not the same as being in person but during COVID, you, you can go to an AA meeting anywhere in the world. It's not going to be the same as, you know, sitting in a group. Uh, but if you're able to find a group, I know some groups in D.C. meet in, uh, you know, parking garages or in a park. But ensure that you're able to take that time uh, and, you know, tell your family or your friends, hey, I need an hour and I'm going to be, you know, out. I'll be back, but I'm doing something important to take care of myself. Okay, great. Anybody else have a question? Go ahead, go ahead, David, I'm sorry. No, I'm just wondering if there's any other questions. Uh, Comments even? I have about seven minutes, it looks like. Yeah. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you mm. would want us to comment on? Good. We like questions. <laughs> or your thoughts. So here's one. Um, uh, so there are two that's coming in. One is person saying, I need a minute to type it. If you become aware that work colleagues and students will not be celebrating the holidays because they are unable to be with family and will be alone, how can you be there for them to make the holidays a little less isolating? That's from Tess Marsh. That is, that's a great question. And, you know, again, uh, I'm obviously very biased to Susquehanna, but during COVID, there were many, many students who uh, either didn't have homes to go to, back to, or they weren't able to travel back. And Susquehanna went to, you know, they were very thoughtful about how, how do we maintain the community and create a, uh, you know, a different kind of community that's just as supportive. And, you know, depending on your comfort, uh, I think it is, you know, really wonderful if either you consider inviting them to participate in your holidays, people like to share their traditions and they may even be able to bring food that you've never had before or share a tradition that is something of theirs. Um, you know, as comfortable as you are, you can open up your house, uh, you know, to share those traditions. Uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the elderly and in nursing mm -hmm. homes over the holidays. Uh, and unfortunately with COVID, it's much worse. Uh, families with very good intentions would say, hey, you know, grandma, we want grandma here all day on Saturday. Well, it was exhausting for grandma and no one really asked. And the question is, are there things that you could do that would be really meaningful for grandma? Because when she gets out of the nursing home, she gets really confused because she's not in the surroundings that she's familiar with. So are you able to say, hey, let's do something over FaceTime or let's take the kids in, you know, for you know, a little bit and take some pictures in and make a frame or do something with grandma for a shorter period of time or have a meal, share that kind of, you know, experience. You know, it, don't worry about the gifts, but share an experience. Uh, and the other thing about gifts, uh, I would be cautious about gifts. A lot of people are on fixed income and you'd be surprised at how many elderly people or, you know, single income fam families who don't have money will sacrifice not paying their bills or the medication in order to get gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Gifts are great. They're always fun to get and share, but you know, the, the holiday season isn't really about, uh, you know, getting gifts. It's, I think it's about sharing a, an experience. So just like, you know, with people who don't have family, you can invite them in, you can share your experience, have coffee with them. You can also volunteer in DC and I'm sure there's other, uh, you know, opportunities in almost every town, you know, getting together with a group of people and, and providing food, 
uh, or entertainment or Christmas caroling, all of those kinds of things can bring people in. Um, Very good. So, um, David, there are two more here. It just says, thanks, David and Stacy. This has been very helpful. Happy holidays, Len and Jonathan. So from President Green. And then the, there's one more um, that, um, that we may be able to answer very, very briefly. Uh, please extend, expand on self-imposed expectations versus expectations imposed by others. You have to be honest with yourself, you know, if, if you're trying to meet everybody else's expectations, uh, there's no way not to be stressed out. And, you know, we, we are not perfect and we're gonna disappoint people, each and every one of us. And we are gonna be disappointed. Uh, but thinking about, is there a way to say, you know, I understand what your expectations are, but I really wanna do something to celebrate the holiday with you. Uh, what can we do together or how can we meet somewhere in the middle uh, to do something that we're both comfortable with? Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, to, you know, provide or do, or, you know, all the things that you'd like to do, you know, this year over the holidays. Um, again, you, you're, you're going to meet with mixed uh, responses. I wish everyone would say, oh, I understand that, let's do that. Some people will and some people may not. And, uh, you know, as much as we wanna take, as much as we care for people and want them to, you know, enjoy the holidays, you know, it's not all up to us to make everybody's holiday. It's mm -hmm. really up to ourselves to make a holiday for our, ourselves and to be able to share that with other people. Because if we're gloomy and we're not shining, it's, it's not gonna be shared with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So it is 7.58 is what I have. Um, there's, a, there's a quick, I don't know if we can answer this one quickly about any improvements in mental health towards destigmatization. Um, one, one of our, uh, the folks here, Sandra Altman asked, um, about that and what, what are, have we seen movement in our career? Um, Absolutely. About. Absolutely. You know, having webinars like this, uh, talking about mental health in the news, sharing our own personal stories, mm -hmm. uh, as hard as some of them may be, if you're comfortable enough talking about them, um, you know, understanding, trying to understand how can I be supportive uh, it's important. How can I be supportive versus how can I fix you? It's sure. That's really good. To distinguish. That's really good. And I think the, the, the main, um, kind of, um, way that I can see that mental health has been stigmatized is just the sheer demand for services. Yes. And so that, um, that I don't know many people with private practices who don't have a wait list. And yeah. that is my, my friends and colleagues from across the country, yes. um, and certainly here in Snyder County, the same is true. Uh, and so that I think that people are seeking help more and that you see it more talked about in kind of the national discourse, even among celebrity types. And so I think that there is that stigmatization. And yeah. one of the most painful things for me to say is no, I don't have time. Yeah, I, really I agree. Like I agree. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was really great. Dr. German, thanks thank you. for all your wisdom. It was wonderful um, and very insightful. Uh, the next session in the alumni speaker series is Creating the Life You Want with Jamie Mahusky Heinemann on Tuesday, January 11th at 7 p.m. For more information about this and other events, go to suualum.com. May the holiday season bring what Dr. German said earlier, peace and love and light and good night. Okay, good night. Happy holidays, everyone.